Well, we're going to begin a new series, and uh, <clears throat> probably it'll be interrupted every now and then as we have different situations come up, but we're going to go through the, uh, the first letter of the church to Corinthians. And uh, <clears throat> if you look on that black, on the back board, the black board, it says endurance. That's the word that God gave us for 2016, endurance. How many of you feel like you've been running a race for the first half of this year? Uh, <clears throat> and at times you wonder, am, am I going to get through this race? You will endure because God is going to take you through. The purpose of the epistle of 1 Corinthians <clears throat> is, is that God is building endurance within his body. The church is in a culture that is anti-Christ, anti-godliness, anti-holiness, and God recognizes that. And so he literally sent Paul to write to a church, and we'll tell you what that church was like and where they were situated, uh, a church that was very much like us, under fire from every segment of society, only a whole lot worse, a whole lot worse. And so we're going to look at how to build endurance within the church through looking at what the Apostle Paul said to the church at Corinth. Uh, this morning we'll probably just go through an, an introduction. It always helps if I turn it on. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and here's the first one. Let's look at some background information. Most of you probably knew that the, the epistle called 1 Corinthians... An epistle is a letter. That's not the wife of an apostle. Uh, that uh, the epistle of 1 Corinthians was written to the church at? Corinth. Anybody? Well, you can look up there and see. city of Corinth was where? In Greece. Yeah, you can look it up there. The apostle Paul wrote it. It's a, some of the books of the Bible... Uh, the Bible is not clear as to where those or who wrote those books. Uh, however, the book of 1 Corinthians is very, very clear. In the opening uh, verses, which we'll read maybe one through four or five or six today, uh, it was very clear that the Apostle Paul wrote those, uh, probably the greatest apostle who ever lived. And he was on his third missionary journey, and he wrote it from the city of Ephesus, uh, another New Testament city. And he wrote it about 55 A.D. A.D. stands for Anno Domini, or in the year of the Lord. In other words, uh, 55 after Christ. Uh, 55 A.D. or after Christ. Corinth's location, if you looked at, the, uh, at Greece on a map, down at the bottom of Greece, you'd see a strip of land that came down like this, a strip of land that came down like this, uh, and then there's a strip of land that goes across with water opening out onto the Mediterranean here and water that opened out onto the Mediterranean here. And so there were two seaports, and there was a, what is called an isthmus. And if you remember studying about isthmus, boy, that's hard to say. Uh, it's just basically, instead of an island, which is land surrounded by water, an isthmus is uh, land here, land here, water here, water here. And, by the way, what's coming up in August on a national scene? Sports? The Olympics. Okay, the Olympics. Guess where they were started? In Greece. And the games were, uh, were played at the, on this isthmus right there at Corinth, as well as, and it was kind of like we have today, where there are several venues and there are several different locations around a major city. And so Corinth was a part of that, and those games were played, uh, some of them right there on that isthmus where Corinth was located. So it was in southern Greece, two harbors, uh, which always made a city very wealthy. It was the chief and capital city of the southern region of Greece. And uh, 250,000, a quarter of a million residents. And it's estimated by secular terms uh, and research that every one of those quarter of a million residents of Corinth 
had two slaves each. Now that's a million slaves on top of, oh, excuse me, that's a half a million slaves on, thank you, <laughs> uh, on, on top of the quarter of a million residents there. Big place. And uh, as big cities are, and I was never happier than to move away from Buffalo. I hate big cities. I love the country. Uh, Cheryl love big cities, but I, I love the country. And uh, big cities are raucous. They're loud. They're, they're often known as places of, of great uh, sin. And uh, so uh, Corinth was no different than that. They were intrigued, the citizens, by Greek philosophy. They worshipped at the god of the human intellect, if I can put it that way. They loved the human mind, and they, man's mind could do everything. Philosophy is two Greek words, philo, which means love, and sophia, which means wisdom. The love of wisdom. They loved human earthly wisdom. They just loved it. They thought the answers to all of man's problems are in the wisdom of man. Have we heard that before? How's that worked? How's that working for mankind? Not really good, okay? Uh, and so they were intrigued by and loved and focused on and they were fixated on Greek philosophy. They were also captivated, captivated by the athletic games, the Olympic games held there on the isthmus, right where their city was. Uh, Amazingly enough, part of that was that in order, obviously, to operate within the Olympic Games, you have to be in really excellent shape. And so they formed and fashioned, hand-tooled Greek gods, <laughs> Greek gods, I, how's that work for you? A god that you fashion with your own hands. You know, we do that a lot today in America. It's just not sticks and stones. It's different kinds of things we fashion with our own hands. And so they literally not only worship the human mind, they worship the human physiology. In fact, part of what was known in Corinth was that they all wanted to look like the Greek gods. And so they all were slim and trim and they ate all the right things and, and, and uh, it was very important to them that they looked, today we would say sexy, but they looked that way. So they worshipped at the God of the human mind. They worshipped at the God of the human body. And they had, we're going to just tell you a little bit more uh, about this. The religion of that area, there were, just in the city of Corinth, were 12 huge temples. They were the temples of all kinds of gods and goddesses. One of them was uh, uh, Aphrodite, who was known as the goddess of love. I would call her the goddess of lust uh, rather than love. But, uh, uh, and she was only one of the 12 temples of the gods that were worshipped there. And the worship in her temple was led by 1,000 prostitutes who taught that sexual immorality was the highest level and sexual freedom was the highest level of freedom that man could achieve to. So they worshipped at the human intellect, they worshipped the human body, and, and they wanted to be known for the fact that they were sexually free. They could do anything they wanted to do. Does that sound like a place we know called the USA? Really the world? To succumb to that teaching was known as being Corinthianized. Only they used that as a good term. It was a really good term to them. They've been Corinthianized, which means they lived by the high standards of, of intellect and beautiful physiology and, and freedom sexuality. And, and those were the things that they valued in the culture of Corinth. Way worse than the United States is. That's hard to believe, but it is. And so that's where the church of Corinth was situated. Now, those who were in the church came out of that culture. One of the things I noticed that even if you were, you know, even if you're a church member, you're affected by your culture. Any of you notice that you find yourself being affected by your culture in ways you don't like? 
Oh, yeah. I mean, it's all around you. It's called being enculturated. just means that the, the culture is, is saturating within you. And you begin to have thoughts of, and philosophies of lifestyle that are a part of the way the world lives, and you don't even recognize it. You, you don't see it. And uh, so that's a major part of what Paul was going through as he was writing to the church at Corinth. These were brand new baby Christians. And, and they were carnally minded to say, say it in theological terms. It means they just they lived out of the flesh. They were born again. They knew they had to be saved through Christ. But they had all of these, they were like barnacles on a ship of sins that hung on from the culture that they came from. That was the Corinthian church. It was not a very godly church. In fact, Paul speaks to the Corinthian church and he says, you think that you're, you're mature and you're wise. And he said, I tell you, you're babies in Christ. You're babies. You don't understand the basic thoughts of spirituality. And so he wrote this uh, epistle and the one that follows, 2 Corinthians, in order to say to them, Christ loves you. He died for you. He saved you and he wants you to endure to the end and he doesn't want you to be led astray by the culture that you came out of that is still in you. We just said, all of us, we're, we're touched and in some way uh, we feel the tug of the culture that we're in. And they did too, and it was not a good culture. So, uh, you know, that's, uh, uh, that's the culture they were in. Being a seaport city in those days, I man, if you're a seaport city, and it probably did today too in, uh, in uh, New York City and, and San Francisco and any seaport city, is for the most part a wealthy city in terms of income. All the industrialists are, are there. And so being a wealthy seaport city, they had everything they wanted, including two slaves apiece. They didn't even have to do their work. The slaves did the work for them. They lived with moral abandonment, and they worshipped at the god of self. They had all the freedoms you could possibly imagine except the one freedom that matters the most. Freedom from sin and self. If we are enslaved by what I want, what I demand, what my flesh wants, we're out of order in God's kingdom. We're out of order. If we're doing that which pleases us, and we're not asking God what pleases you, we will not endure in the kingdom of God. And so Paul wrote this book to say to them, warning, warning, warning. You're in the kingdom. You're baby Christians. You're carnal Christians. And that's okay if you're a baby because you don't know any better. But Paul says, I'm calling you to grow up into the image of Christ. Set aside those things that are literally tearing you apart. Uh, spiritually. So the Christian church was understandably greatly influenced by this ungodly culture that they found themselves in. Real simple outline, although it's 16 chapters, uh, and it'll probably take the better part of a year. Hang in there because whenever we need Christmas time or whatever, we'll preach around it. But, uh, you know, I really, and I, as always, I pray, Lord, what do you want me to preach? And I kept coming back to 1 Corinthians, and I kept saying, God, I, I, I don't preach that, you know. And God said, I want you to preach that. And I said, okay, all right, I'll preach what you want. So uh, this, here's a simple outline. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 9 is the introduction. It's Paul's greeting, and we'll read those verses in a couple of minutes. Paul's greeting, uh, and also... The praise from Paul to God for the gifts that God had given to them. You know, what were the gifts that God had given to them? We're not talking spiritual gifts here. In a couple of verses in, in 1 5 says what those gifts were. They were grace and peace. God's gifts are grace and peace. Look at me for just a second. What would you like more than anything else? 
unmerited favor from God. We don't want to be judged by God for what we've done wrong. We want His grace. That's unmerited favor. And Paul says, I thank God He has given you as Corinthian uh, Christians, He's given you His grace. And then based on the grace that He's given to you, He's given you His peace. What would you like more in life than anything else? As you think about this life and eternity, peace, peace. And Paul refers to those as the gifts of God. And in the opening verses, he says, I thank God that he gave you the gifts of grace and peace. We probably should be saying that same prayer. Lord, thank you. We don't get what we deserve. I'm grateful. I don't get what I deserve. Never mind you. <laughs> uh, we don't get what we deserve. That's called grace, unmerited favor from God. And then peace as an outworking of that grace. So that's the introduction. And then chapter 1, verses 10 through chapter 6, verse 20, Paul confronts the church with the sin that's there. If you have a church, a church is made up of what? Christians who are what? Human. So if you have human beings in the church, are you going to have sin in the church? If you've got a pastor behind the pulpit, you've got sin. I'm, I'm definitely not saying, and I'm not living in sin. God forbid. I want to be going the other direction. But does that mean that never in a day do I have a, a, an angry thought or, a, 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 you know, or do something or say something that I shouldn't? Uh, sins of omission, sins of commission? No, I'm human. You're human. And so Paul begins to lay out for them, not to chastise them, not to beat them up, but rather to say to them, God loves you and he wants you at peace and he wants you living in grace. So here's some things that are coming against you that I want to warn you about, coming from your culture and coming from your flesh. And as you surrender these to Christ and you learn to obey Christ, you'll have much more peace and much more grace. And so that's what he's saying in all of this. So he's going to take five chapters to confront the sins that are there in the church. Isn't that interesting? Jesus kind of said the same thing. He said, judgment starts at the house of the Lord. I find it very easy to judge the world. Are you like me? We can judge the world all day long. I mean, the world's doing this wrong and the world's doing... God says, no, 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 judgment starts at the house of the Lord. I'm the temple of God, so it's got to start with me. You're the temple of God, it's got to start with you. And so Paul lovingly, lovingly says, here are some issues that you're struggling with. Let me help you understand God's perspective on those and how they hurt you and how as you surrender them to me, you'll be blessed and happy and peaceful. So five chapters of dealing with different sins, and that's the second part of the outline. Then the third part of the outline is uh, chapter 7, verse 1, to chapter 16, verse 4. And the church had a bunch of questions. They wrote to the Apostle Paul, and they said, well, what about this, and what about that? What about marriage? What about divorce? What about, uh, you know, what about the tithes and the offerings? He deals with the tithes and the offerings. Uh, you know, what about money? What about the, these issues of life? Paul, you're the, the, the great apostle. What does God think about these? And so he takes chapter 7 through 16 to answer the questions the church had sent to him. So, uh, and then the last part of it, very simple outline, is chapter 16, verse 5 through verse 24, which is Paul's final instructions and the conclusion of the book. Uh, so I, I assure you, unless God does some sort of miracle, we won't get there next week. <laughs> uh, you know, we're going to take a while, and, uh, and that's okay. Uh, you know, this and I, I like to change styles of preaching. We've been through a, a topical sermon on dreams. That means we took a topic, went through the whole scriptures, looked to see what it said, and we looked up different scriptures. And that's a helpful style of preaching. 
But it's also a helpful style of preaching to preach exegetically. Which exegesis means to draw out of the Scripture verse by verse by verse by verse in a row. So you start with verse 1, chapter 1, and you go all the way to the end, chapter 16, verse 24. And every single verse you look at and say, what's God saying? It's called exegetical preaching. That's my favorite style because I think we get more of the Word and more of God in us in that style. So that's what we're going to do um, in this series. Okay. Uh, These are just a few of the issues we're going to deal with in this. Man's wisdom versus God's wisdom. Moral issues as defined by God. We've got a whole world saying to us, no, 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 moral issues should be defined this way or this way or this way. God says, no, no, no. I created you. I created the human body. I created sexuality. I'll tell you how moral issues need to be if you're going to be blessed and healthy and happy. I'll tell you what needs to be. You know, when was the last time you, your car told you what it needed? I mean, you may read gauges, and you may, they're called idiot gauges for a reason, I guess, because I had one mechanic tell me the only one who pays attention to those are idiots, because by the time the light comes on, it's too late, and you already messed up your engine. <laughs> but, uh, you know, basically, even if cars talk to you, they don't, cars don't know what's best for them, because they didn't create them themselves. We're the creation. God is the creator. He knows what's best for us. He is eternal. We are because he gave us eternity, but put it within our hearts. So moral issues, questions about uh, singleness, marriage, divorce. And you say, well, boy, do we really want to go through those? Yeah. You know, those are issues that touch every single one of us. As I've been reading through 1 Corinthians, I'm aware of the fact, and I, I, please don't be offended by this, but these are some of the thoughts that, that I go through. As of, I don't know, eight or nine months, I'm a widower. I guess that means I'm eligible to remarry. You know what? I'm not thinking about it. In fact, I'm kind of looking at what the Apostle Paul said, which was, if you're single, it's best to stay that way. The book of Corinthians has spoken to me. And God says, if, you, if you're single, whether by, because you haven't married, or if you're a widow or, or a widow, you know, you're best to stay single. And so I'm already taking wisdom from the Apostle Paul and saying, you know, these are my options. Now, what's God's option for me? What's God's option? So this book is affecting me before I ever start preaching to you. So questions about singleness, marriage, divorce, respect for the Lord's Supper. Uh, I so love the dream that God gave to you about being, becoming a uh, Eucharistic minister, about opening up and serving, and now in three different churches, serving communion. And there is a respect for communion that needs to be observed because it's the celebration of the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. His blood and his body shed for us because he loves us. So there is a high level of respect for that. And the book of Corinthians deals with that, talks about that. And the church at Corinth was doing some things. They were partying along with their communion services. And the Apostle Paul says, you think I call you liberal and high-minded? I call you immature. You, you're, that's sin. And so he deals with some of those issues. <clears throat> some of the things we go through in this passage, guess what? You're going to be able rightfully so to say, well, praise God, that's not an issue I struggle with. <laughs> and then every now and then you come across an issue and say, oh, that's an issue I struggle with. Uh, that's okay. You don't have to tell me. You don't want to, uh, you know, we'll, we'll pray for each other and, uh, you know, trust God to, to help us overcome those issues. Proper perspectives on spiritual gifts, and we're talking about the uh, however many spiritual gifts, depending on how you divide the book of 1 Corinthians, there, I, I've seen as many as 21 preached on and I've seen as few as 12 preached on. But the Bible lists spiritual gifts and 
1 Corinthians, Paul tells us how we ought to deal with that. But before he even starts with it, you know what he says? Before you get to talking about spiritual gifts, he says, let's talk about love. Because love is more important. Loving each other and treating each other in loving ways is a better way to go. Does God want to give you spiritual gifts? Absolutely. Does he want you to flow in those gifts? Absolutely. And the healthier churches are going to be the more the whole body needs to flow in spiritual gifts. It's just the way it is. That's the way God designed us. But understand that those spiritual gifts must be operated out of love. Not arrogance, not pride, uh, but love. And uh, so, an understanding of the resurrection. He's going to deal with the resurrection. You know what? You read what Paul has to say about, revel- uh, about resurrection, you're going to jump out of your pew. You're going to get up and want to run around the church or run around your bed. This, uh, you've heard me say it, and, and I understand our older folks don't like it, because, you know, this church has been here and venerated for a long time. But you know what? This building is scheduled for burning. There is coming a day when God is going to burn this whole planet to ashes. And there will be nothing left of this planet. And then he'll build a new heaven and a new earth that will be awesome. Not touched by sin. You know, Bless Tom and the other trustees. They worked so hard to improve this building and, and, uh, and other members of the church who've worked hard and donated and given. and They've painted and fixed and put borders and, and railings and uh, Janice particularly stained and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, varnished that. I think Bill came and helped her some. Uh, you know, we take pride in this building and that's a good thing. But it's always falling apart. I look at other things. I look at the walls and I think, oh, we've got to do something about those. You know, and we do. And it's important we take care of what God gives to us because those who are faithful in the little things will be faithful in much. So we're going to take care of it. But understand, we don't worship a building. We worship the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is all going. And what's going to be left is our eternal souls and spirits. I love the book of Job where God said to Job, I have put eternity in your hearts. You're eternal. He's going to live forever. (laughs) Praise God. Now if we live for Christ and our faith is in Him, we'll live in, in, in heaven for eternity. If we reject Messiah you know, Jesus the Savior, then those who do will live in hell for eternity. So we want to know where are we going. Uh, so spiritual gifts, an understanding of the resurrection, and finally, yeah, it's not that order, but that everything we do and everything, every way that the church acts should be out of love. You can't get it more clear and more plain uh, than that. Okay. Uh, now, I'm going to take maybe 10 minutes and uh, open up to you the book of First Corinthians, read through the first few verses, and this is what we'll do every week that we preach on Corinthians. We're just going to go verse by verse by verse and tell you what God is saying. You know, God created us. He knows us. He knows every fiber of our being. We were talking about men's fellowship yesterday morning. He knew you in the womb. In fact, He created you in the womb. He gave you the DNA you've got to fulfill His purposes when you grow up. Wow. So, you know, God's our creator, and this is the owner's manual. You know, you understand what Bible stands for. Basic instructions before leaving earth. I don't know how many of you ever heard that before? Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth. Earth is that long. Eternity is forever. What do we need to know about how to get ready for eternity that's forever? Verse 1, chapter 1, 1 Corinthians. 
this letter is from Paul. Duh. <laughs> it, it doesn't get any simpler than that. The Apostle Paul says, I wrote this letter. And then he says, who am I, Paul? I'm chosen by the will of God. It wasn't his will. It wasn't his mother's will. It was God's will. And what was he chosen to be? Not only a believer, but he was chosen to be an apostle. Uh, let's just talk for two seconds about what an apostle is, because it gives him the right to speak to us and to the church of Corinth. An apostle was, it literally means a sent one, like an ambassador. And an apostle is one who was chosen by God and sent as an ambassador to represent God to speak to mankind about what God wanted them to know. And so we would call him today a missionary. He founded a bunch of churches. That's a part of what makes him an apostle. I'm a pastor. I'm a Bible teacher. I'm a counselor. I, you know, I have several giftings that I'm well aware of within the First Corinthians uh, setting. I, I know who and what I am and what my giftings are. But I'm not an apostle. I know that. <laughs> uh, Paul was. He founded churches all over the place. Uh, and so he's an apostle of Christ Jesus. Who does he represent? Who's in the amb he's not an ambassador from the USA or from Greece or from wherever, Israel. He's an apostle or a representative or an ambassador of the heavenly kingdom, Christ Jesus. And so he says, and this letter is also from our brother Sosthenes. That's a Greek name if ever you heard one. Sosthenes. Uh, Sosthenes was a co-worker of Christ. He was probably the, the secretary, not a co-worker, well, it was a co-worker of Christ, but a co-worker of Paul. Uh, and he probably, as Paul dictated, you'll see this in several letters of Paul, Paul didn't write out what he was saying. Paul spoke it, maybe because of an eyesight problem he had. Uh, that's conjecture, but... Uh, uh, you don't see Paul writing anything except at the end of one of his epistles. He said, I want you to know this epistle is from me, so I'm writing my name. See how big it is. Somebody whose eyesight is gone, they write big. And he says, I'm writing my name big at the end of this epistle so that you know I sent this. Somebody else didn't send it. But he dictated this book to Sosthenes. Sosthenes wrote it down. Sosthenes, Sosthenes was first a uh, Jewish uh, ruler at the synagogue of, uh, uh, of uh, Corinth. And then he became a strong Christian. He was beaten at one point for the Apostle Paul and for Christ. The scriptures tell us in the book of Acts, I think it's chapter 17. He was beaten for Christ. So, uh, you know, Sosthenes is an important figure and, uh, you know, an awesome co-worker of the Apostle Paul. So this letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and the brother Sosthenes. Verse 2 says, I am writing to God's church in Corinth. I'm writing to God's church. I don't know how you feel about this. We don't talk a lot about denominationalism uh, for one major reason. You are a member of the body of Christ if your faith is in Christ. You may feel more comfortable in a congregational church or a Baptist church or a, a free Methodist church or a Catholic church. I don't know where you feel most comfortable. But I can tell you this that no one is a part of the true church of Christ without having faith in Christ. There isn't one denomination that has it all straight. We got that? There isn't one denomination that has it all straight. I hope and pray and believe that the four C's is as close as we're going to get for this church as a congregational church. But there are many others who love the Lord who are not congregational. 
And there are some congregationals who don't know Jesus and don't love Jesus and are not spending eternity with Christ. Sleeping in a garage doesn't make us a car. And worshiping in a building doesn't make us a member of the body of Christ. Our faith in Christ makes us a member of the church. That he did the work of salvation for me. That I couldn't do it. And he did it for me. And I put my faith in him that he's going to to do that for me. And so it says, I'm writing to God's church in Corinth, in the city of Corinth, to you who have been called. That's a strong word, called by God. Do you know what you've been called by God to be? You know what he says? I love it. His own holy people. I'm so glad we sang that song this morning. Holiness, holiness is what I long for. That's what this verse says. The opening verse, second verse of chapter 1 says, God has called us to be holy, to be like him. That's a thought, folks. Okay. He's called us not only to be born again, to be saved. He's not just given us Jesus as a fire escape from hell, but he's called us to be holy in this life, to be Christ-like in this life. And it says, he made you holy. How many of you have ever tried to be holy? How'd that work for you? (laughs) I can fail all day long. I can look really good for about 30 seconds, sometimes 30 minutes. But it doesn't take me long in a day before I realize I am not innately holy in any way, shape, or form. My flesh longs to go in the wrong direction. It's a little bit of fun here. Uh, Twice now in the last month I've gone horseback riding, once with my daughter Ginger and and once with uh, uh, Andrea. And they gave me the same horse both times. They've got 80 horses, 82 or 3 horses. Give me the same horse both times. Andrea's horse, I mean, they were so proud of her when she got done with the ride. The woman came up to me and said, she rides like she's been riding her whole life. She had perfect control of that horse. Neck rein just tapped a little here and the horse goes this way. Tap a little here and the horse goes this way. Perfect. And they give me this horse. His name is Shirako. That's an Arab word and it means a desert, hot desert wind. And he'd plod along for about three feet and then he'd stop and he'd put his neck down. He'd sit there and chew. Now we're in a line of about eight horses. And he'd just stop in the middle and and I you know, and he'd stop you know now, I've been on horses a lot and I understand horse control this is just a stubborn horse you have any idea why God would give me a stubborn horse I suppose he was trying to say something you know never mind I can figure it out on my own <laughs> uh His self-will, that horse was bound and determined wherever there was tall grass, every five steps he was going to take a bite. You know? So, uh, I understand I will never be holy because of the works of Gordon. Self-improvement doesn't work. It is Christ who leads us and guides us, who helps us to become holy. And this says... And we are called by God to be his holy people, and he made you holy by means of the holiness of Christ Jesus. He took the full deposit of Christ's holiness. I mean, Christ has an eternal bank account with unlimited supplies of holiness. Christ is all there is to holy. And he, and here's a, here's a mathematical term. Those of you who do accounting... He imputed, that is, he took it from this account and he put it over in this account. That's, accountants will tell you they're imputing, they're doing their imputations. And so 
God the Father, when we believed on Christ, took the holiness out of, of Christ out of his account and put it in our account. He imputed his holiness to us. That's the only way we're going to get there. And for all of eternity, he will finish the work. As you go into eternity, I try so hard and I fail so miserably to be holy. And God says, I got this. I started the work in you of holiness and I will finish the work of holiness. And by the way, by the time that I arrive, you will be right there by my side. We're going to get there together, whether by the upper taker or the undertaker. We'll get there together. Okay. Uh, Okay, so he made you holy by means of Christ Jesus, just as he did for all people everywhere who call on the name of the Lord. Literally, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. And then he says in verse 3, May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you, here it is, grace and peace. Grace and peace. And peace. And he always gives it in that order. May God give us grace and peace. You can't know the peace of God until you live in the grace of God. As long as I say to myself, I can do this, I can be righteous, I can be holy, I'm perfect, I'm right, you're wrong, I'm right, God's wrong. As long as I say that, I'm never going to find peace because I'm always going to be trying to prove to you that I'm right when in reality I've been wrong all along. And only the righteousness of Christ within me and the holiness of Christ within me will ever matter to God the Father. Not my holiness, His holiness. Not my righteousness, His righteousness. I'm so grateful that God has given us, and he says, and that's what I pray for you, that he gives you the grace of God. <clears throat> and it takes grace to admit, I'm a sinner. I know Christians, they don't want to admit they're a sinner. I got no problem admitting I'm a sinner. <laughs> you know it anyway. You know, we know each other well enough to know, and I'm speaking as a human race, we know each other well enough to know that we're human. We have attitudes that are improper. We say things that are improper. We think things that are improper. We do things that are improper. Even when we're trying hard not to. So it is God only who makes us holy. And accepting that fact and saying, Jesus, thank you for making me holy. Because it's the only way I'm going to get there. Thank you. That's accepting the grace of God. And with that comes, oh, okay. I can try, stop trying so hard to be perfect. Perfectionism will kill you. Literally. It'll give you a heart attack. Drive you crazy. God says, rest in my perfection. 